to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 17 tonight. It could be said that we're taking too long to go through Romans chapter 12. Uh, the reality is, and this is week 14, uh, that we have been in this chapter, um, but there is a lot here, and it's not, uh, as we've said many times, it's not uh, concepts that are beyond importance or beyond our uh, ability to apply. They are truly practical instruction for how we are to live this Christian life in the day and age in which we live. So as we've gone through the chapter, we have seen that Paul has dealt with a wide variety of relational instruction. He has uh, dealt with how we are to carry on our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, and our relationships with the world. <clears throat> Paul now turns to explicit instruction on how to face a hostile world. Now, surely we have each, at some point in time or another, uh, dealt with people who uh, are not just unbelievers, but they display an animosity towards the gospel. They are hostile to our testimony. Uh, so let's look at verse 17, and uh, we'll dig in here as best we can. It says, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. So let me ask the question, as we usually do, what do you see in this verse? What stands out to you? What, what do you feel is the important takeaway from verse 17? I always love the silence. Yes. Yeah. So. You can't do good and evil. What's that? You can't do good and evil. Now you can't give evil for evil. That's for sure. All right. Well, Anything you, else? You just won't be vengeful. You gotta just talk on your God. Yeah. Yeah. Ray always says, "Show me kindness." I don't know. That's yeah. just. <laughs> well. <coughs> it's a good start. It, it's a good start. It's a good start. Anybody else? Don't take revenge. <laughs> All right. Anybody? Just leave it in the Lord's hands. Absolutely. What about the second part of the verse? <clears throat> it reminds me of integrity. I know that integrity is supposed to be honesty and never impersonal, whatever, but we know that people are always looking to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me read the, what the Amplified Bible, how it renders it for uh, this particular verse. <clears throat> it says, never repay anyone evil for evil. Take thought for what is right and gracious and proper in the sight of everyone. So the message of the first part of this verse is clear instruction that is found throughout Scripture. The concept in verse 17, the first part of verse 17, is not something new that Paul has just suddenly come up with through the inspiration of the Spirit. It is something that we have seen all through Scripture. Uh, it's in the Psalms, it's in the Proverbs, it is in the life of Christ, the ministry of Christ. So let me just give you a few verses here. Psalm 34, 14 says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Matthew 5, 39 says, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Matthew 5, 44 says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Matthew 5, as we are all aware, uh, is part of the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, that's uh, some very practical instruction as well. And in fact, once we're finished with Romans chapter 12, that's going to be our next study on Wednesday nights. We're going to go through the Sermon on the Mount. 
and uh, look at the Beatitudes. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says, Not rendering evil for evil, but or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. So in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the word blessing is the word from which we get our word eulogize. And it basically means to speak well of someone. When you go to a funeral and somebody gets up and begins to give the eulogy, uh, very seldom, if ever, do you hear them get up and say, this guy was a dirty, rotten, no good for nothing, a scoundrel, and I'm glad he's gone, and he just did me dirty. Doesn't happen very often. Right? Usually when someone gets up to do the eulogy, they've been handpicked by the family to ensure that he's not going to get uh, disrespected during the service. But it's usually memories and things that, that put that person in a good light. And so that plays into uh, what we're looking at here tonight. John MacArthur says this. He says, the blessing that a Christian is to give to the reviler includes finding ways to serve him, praying for his salvation or spiritual progress, expressing thankfulness for him, speaking well of him, and desiring his well-being. How's that for a concept? Talk about something that may be challenging to do. Just a little bit. We're talking about how we respond to people that outright hate us and despise us and revile us. People that are nasty and cruel and, and intend to try to hurt us. We are to treat them completely opposite of what they treat us. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 21 to 23 says this. For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges, judgeth righteously. Uh, Luke chapter 6 and verse 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and shaken together. And running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. So we are to give the opposite of what we receive. How does that look practically? I mean, what steps can we take uh, in a practical manner, maybe even at this time of the year, whereby we can return blessing for evil and good for cruelty. Now, I'm pretty confident that most of you have a mental image in your mind right now of someone that just pushes your buttons and has been mean and cruel and insensitive. How can you treat them quite the opposite of the way they treated you. You the way? <laughs> and I am not moving because of that. But <laughs> Give a Christmas card or a little cookie or something? Christmas card, a nice one. Yeah, a nice one. Right? Not one I hope we get some in. cookies with like a track in it. Yeah. As well as a Christmas card. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about this more as we get uh, near the end of chapter twelve. But it is truly being Christ like when we treat those who are cruel or mean to us in the opposite manner. Right? It is to show forth the love of Christ and the reality of our faith. Uh, what is the natural reaction? We all know what that is. So it shouldn't be hard to get somebody to 
speak up here? What, what is the natural uh, reaction when somebody treats us mean? Retaliate. Retaliate. Get even. Vengeance, right? I've heard it said that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But God uses human instruments to accomplish his will. <laughs> He's chosen me. Uh, that is not what's being said here, and that's not what's being said through the ministry of Christ. If you look at all of these passages combined, and you look at the message that has been given in all of them, what is it saying to us? Be Christ-like. In, in a manner of speaking, yes. But in a practical manner. To be Christ-like is, is, is a concept that, that is pretty broad. But if we nail it down to specifics. Vicki, you were saying something? Take the high road. Take the high road. All right? Do the opposite of what somebody who is trying to get you upset is trying to do. Recompense or repay to no man evil for evil. But yet that's what our flesh wants to do. Right? The old nature that dwells within every single one of us has that need to pay somebody back. To let them have it. Hold nothing back. Just let it go. To repay evil for evil is to follow the inclination of the flesh. It is to allow the old nature to rule and reign and have its way. Can we then go to 1 John 1 9? <laughs> <laughs> we, we could. We could. Uh, but. I think there's something about in uh, in the scriptures about not you know abusing grace. Uh, yeah. For those who are online, that was the chairman of the deacons. <laughs> pray for him. Yeah, pray for him. Pray for me. To retaliate in kind is natural. Right? It just comes natural to every single one of us. To turn the other cheek and then to go further and reward good for evil is divine. That is of God. And we need his help in order to do that. Can you think of any Old Testament examples of this kind of behavior? Joseph. Joseph and his brothers in Egypt. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, they abused him, they, they uh, threw him into a pit, they sold him into slavery, and his life in Egypt was not always good and enjoyable, it was a difficult existence, but when his brothers came during the famine, what did he do? He blessed them, he, he, he provided for them, he, he was kind. Forgave them. He forgave them, Absolutely. Uh, this was also David's attitude so, towards Saul. Yeah. You think of Saul and the way he treated David and the attempts that he made on David's life. Mm -hmm. And then when David had opportunity to uh, kill Saul and get even and get out from underneath this threat, David cut off the hem of his garment and then was so convicted that he felt bad about doing it. David exhibited this kind of behavior just as Joseph did. And then in the New Testament, we have Saul or Paul. Uh, uh, Paul was mistreated by his people. They sought to slay him. They did their best to undermine his work. They sowed discord and heresy in the churches that he planted. And they never ceased to try and turn his converts against him. But yet he prayed passionately for their conversion. And he never ceased trying to win them to Christ. He lived his faith to the fullest. Did my microphone just die? No. <laughs> um, could I get a couple of uh, AA batteries? 
We could also say the same about Stephen and <coughs> even Christ on the cross. Yeah, exactly. Stephen uh, prayed <coughs> what? Do not let this charge come against them. Yeah. And Christ prayed and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Uh, that is uncommon behavior in the world in which we live. Right? I mean, if we unintentionally uh, hurt someone or do something that, that ends up offending someone, it is not uncommon for them to try to get back at us. But when the shoe is on the other foot, when they have hurt us, it is part of our responsibility as followers of Christ to treat them completely the opposite way that they have treated us. To give them a blessing, to treat them with respect. Uh, <clears throat> and it's not easy to do, right? Uh, we've talked about loving our brothers and sisters in Christ, and sometimes that can be uh, in itself a little bit challenging uh, because they test our patience. But this is people who are outside of the household of faith. Uh, I should have asked Dean if he knew where the batteries were. <laughs> They're just, as you go into Brenda's office on the left side, <laughs> unless you got kidnapped. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so as you look at the last part of this verse, the second half, if you will, provide things honest in the sight of all men. What does that mean? said people are watching especially watching Christians and uh, they either want to say that they're hypocritical to the world because uh, Christians don't act the way they think or um, we kind of, we, we grieve the spirit of, of God uh, when we don't respond the way Christ has lined it out in the word yeah absolutely there I work again uh, so I go back to the question I asked that nobody answered. What do you see in the last part of this verse? What does that last part mean? King James says, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Don't choose any motive. It's a good way, place to start, yeah. People of integrity. John MacArthur, uh, in his commentary, goes on and says this, a person to whom God has given undeserved blessings instead of judgment should seek the blessing that he will receive when giving a free gift of forgiveness to someone who has wronged him. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35, if you turn over there with me, keep your finger in Romans 12. At Matthew chapter 18. In verse 21 through the end of the chapter. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall I Shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought to him which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, <clears throat> have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. 
Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. And then his Lord, after that he had called him and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tor tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto thee, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So what is Christ saying here when Peter says, do I forgive my brother seven times? And Christ says, not seven times, but 70 times seven. So 70 times 7 is what? 100 and 490. 490. All right. I'm, I'm, it's been a long day. I knew it was somewhere up there. That's why I said 100. Anyway, is Christ saying, keep track, mark them off, and when you reach 490, boom! no limit on it. That, that phrase of 70 times 7 is to give the, the message that this is not about keeping track of the offenses that have been given or made against us. It is about forgiveness. As we have received forgiveness, we are to give forgiveness. Um, we are to provide things honest in the sight of all men. Uh, in relationship to this, John Phillips writes this. He says, in all of his social dealings, the Christian is to live beyond reproach. He is to be scrupulously honest in all of his dealings with his fellow men. His word must be his bond, no matter how inconvenient that may be later to make it good. He is not to profess one thing and practice another. Uh, unfortunately, in the Church of Jesus Christ, there are those who do not practice this. Uh, they are known in the business world, in the community, as being unscrupulous, of being uh, deceptive in their business practices. That ought never to be said of a child of God. There should be never an example or, or justification for someone of the world to look at us and bring into disrepute the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the way we have conducted ourselves. So this brings out a principle that is uh, wide ranging. And we're going to get to that in just a minute. But if we were to spend time studying the life of Paul, we would find that Paul practiced what he preached. Was it related to finances? He was above board and above reproach. In 1 Corinthians 16, verses 3 and 4, we see that. Uh, Paul worked with his own hands. He was not afraid of physical labor. 1 Corinthians 4, 11 through 12, uh, and 1 Corinthians 9, 9 through 12, and verses 18 and 19 support that. Uh, and he was also uh, giving in relationship to supporting his fellow missionary team. Acts chapter 20 and verse 34. So Paul was above reproach. He was beyond it. Even when uh, he could have bribed a, uh, a corrupt official and secured his own release from prison, Paul refused to do that. Uh, 
he scorned such misconduct. And we read of that in Acts 24, verse 26. One commentator has said this, and this is good. He said that Christian conduct should never betray the high moral standards of the gospel, or it will provoke the disdain of unbelievers and bring the gospel into disrepute. 2 Corinthians 8.21 says, Providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. The word provide in Romans 12.17 uh, some translators have rendered this, be careful. It literally means to think beforehand. So a literal interpretation of it is to think beforehand or to consider in advance. So how does that look in the way we live our lives? It means think first, then act. It means to consider beforehand what you want to say and then speak after you consider. To ensure what? You respond the right way. You respond the right way, but why is it important to respond the right way? If you don't say something against Christ, you will bring the gospel or Jesus Christ into disrepute to, to bring shame upon his cause. And that is the last thing any of us want to be doing. Well, that's like Ray, when we're driving, well, when he's driving, um, and these guys just bebop in and out and don't obey the law and everything. It just gets his goat. And, uh, and I said to Ray, well, instead of going on and on and on like that, why don't you just say, Lord bless them. Just bless them. And in blessing them, you'll feel better instead of getting me stressed out listening to them. <laughs> Had to bring up driving, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> one area I'm weak in. Well, one of the areas I'm weak in. Oh, one of me. <laughs> one Greek scholar in relationship to this word provide uh, wrote this. He said, Take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. So our highest goal is to bring glory to the name of Christ. Amen. Right? Our life, our actions, our attitudes, our words are to bring glory to our Savior. They are to point men and women to the Christ that we love and we say we are following. Suggesting that the conduct of the believer ought not to act in a careless manner, but rather ought to consider how any action will reflect on the gospel is what is being said here. We are to consider how will this look on the cause of Christ? How will someone respond? How will someone react to what I'm doing or what I'm saying or where I'm going and how will that look as a Christian Donald Gray Barnhouse writes this he says the true follower of Christ is to face life with definite consideration of all that he must do to ponder the effects of his movements on other people so to live his life that the things that are noble good pure and true will mark him now, I made mention of a principle just a few minutes ago. It is the principle of keeping everything in my life in a certain, within certain boundaries, so that the cause of Christ does not suffer. So how does that look practically? What areas should I be cautious of as I seek to win others to Christ and I seek to be a witness for him? Self-control. Self-control? Yeah. 
how you can reboot it. In my case, it's in this one. That's my question. It's because I cannot be getting on the phone to insist to me it's not going to happen because something happened or they tried to do it. Yep, absolutely. It basically covers every aspect of our lives. The music we listen to, the reading material that's found in our homes, the entertainment that we watch, the language that we use, the attitudes we exhibit. Right? I don't know about you, but this is kind of convicting. Because there are times even in my life as a pastor that I, I, I have to rebuke myself because I have to, you know, wait a minute. You're a pastor in this community. You cannot be telling somebody that they're a loser. <laughs> and I apologize for that. But, <laughs> but it is hard to do, Pastor. It, it, it is, is hard to really do. It is hard to do if we're being honest. Like, I, I don't think I, well, I hope I'm not putting myself under the bus, but I don't think I could do a whole week being like you're saying. A whole week? Because different things arise. And, yeah. and it's, it's hard to have such a Christ-like attitude and respond as Christ would. So let me ask this question, because that's, that brings up a good, a good thought. It's hard. Lord, you know it's hard. Is that sufficient excuse? No. I don't think it's an excuse, but I think it's reality. It may be reality, but I, there's nothing in here that says if you have sufficient strength at that moment, provide things are honest in the sight of all men. It is we understand that living the Christian life is not easy, period. Okay. Right? That, that being Christ-like in every facet of our life is not something that is for the faint of heart. It's not something for people who, who are weak-minded or weak spiritually. It is a battle. Right? It brings us right back to spiritual warfare. That we are in warfare every single day from the moment your feet hit the floor of your bedroom until the time you get back into bed at night, you are in a battle with the forces of evil. That's right. I found myself in situations like that uh, that I've had to call upon the Lord to take care of the action to give me the proper response and the proper words. Because Absolutely. I knew, I, did, I knew what I wanted to say. Yeah. But then it and what a great habit yeah. to, to stop before we react. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because what does the devil want us to do? Yeah. He wants us to just let him have it. Blow your top, <laughs> let it fly, don't hold anything back. That is not the way of Christ. And so a great habit for us to get into is that before we respond, before we react, we pray. And, you know, just a quick, Lord, I need your help right now. I, I need your wisdom. I need your guidance. And I need your control. Because if we're left to our own devices, and if we're as weak as we know we are, and if this is as hard as we know it is, we need his help every single Amen. day. Amen. Right? Yeah. Mike? Just a thought, you know, when I look at the, uh, the Bible, I look at the example of Jesus. And for him, he was up very early in the morning. He was already praying because he knew it was going to be a battle out there. And I think that speaks to me. and says, you know what? If prayer doesn't be through the day, if I don't spend time with the one thing to me through it, and I mean, that his grace and his wisdom, it's not going to happen with Christ. If he's going to walk away for a week and then walk into the real world and respond in, 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 in the supernatural, it isn't going to happen because it's a battle. It means you 
constantly have to give this in a war. Okay, the yeah. Romans were making all the time to clear out the prison beforehand to clear out iron, as you said, the army. Then the Catholics wanted to help you through the day. You would have problems. Yeah. If we are not starting our day with the Lord and asking for His help and guidance throughout the day, we're going to be fighting an uphill battle. Donald Barnhouse uh, finishes this thought. <clears throat> And he says, a true believer in Christ will seek to be outwardly attractive as well as inwardly holy. That's good. A true believer will seek to be outwardly attractive, not just inwardly holy. You know, we can be spiritual all we want to, and we can we can talk the talk and we can we can be studious. But if it's not affecting the way we live and what the world sees, then it's not reality. Right? Sunday morning is not indicative necessarily of the depth of our spiritual lives. Because most of us on Sunday morning can muster enough spiritual depth to look like we are top shelf Christians. Drew. You, you were brought up in the Did you come across fellow Christians that were afraid that they, uh, they were ordered to do something in hard times? Or in a situation where they had a lot of problems, they were going to force it or they were And then, what was your advice to them? To pray for forgiveness? After, you know, like, a little bit of exposure? Or yeah, we're not. What we're, what we're talking about here is not defending yourself or defending your family or, or you know, <clears throat> fighting in a war. We're talking about uh, regular day-to-day -day conduct whereby we say we're one thing, but we conduct our lives completely different. Uh, I, I had more than one story of dealing with Christians uh, who ended up in the cell block accused of crimes that were less than Christ-like. Um, and uh, without going into details tonight, one was a deacon in a Baptist church uh, and um, was charged with indecent exposure. Uh, and, you know, it, that stuff is obviously harmful to the cause of Christ. But what we're talking about uh, in Romans 12, 17 is just the day-to-day -day conduct, right? Not many of us are going to be arrested and charged with indecent exposure. <clears throat> I certainly hope not. Uh, what we're talking about is the way I conduct my life Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and how I interact with the world at large. That temptation to just be harsh. Uh, I was in the grocery store this afternoon uh, picking up a few things and, and uh, there was a line item. Everybody and their brother was at the grocery store because Christmas is coming and because there's a snowstorm coming. So I was in line, and uh, there was all of the checkouts were busy, and the self-checkout was busy, and uh, I don't like using self-checkout because they they don't pay me. So I, you know, anyway, uh, I was standing there. I was the next one to go to the first spot open, and a lady came up beside me and said, "Are you in line for the self-checkout?" I said, "I'm in line for the first thing to open." So she said, okay, and she got behind me. And, uh, and then the customer service booth was the first thing open, and, and uh, I was starting to turn, and this elderly lady, you know, that 70 plus. <laughs> this elderly lady just, boom, right in front of me. And I thought, what? What's going on here? And I was tempted to make some sarcastic remark. You know, like, no, go ahead, by all means, I insist. 
<laughs> but I thought, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> There's no need for that. Right? It's, it's just day-to-day situations that we all find ourselves in. Whereby we can either be Christ-like or we can let the flesh rule supreme. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It, it is, uh, it, it's not uh, some of those, maybe those unique situations where we may find ourselves in where we have to use force or whatever. But um, in those situations, they happen, right? Uh, even as a, if a Christian police officer has to use deadly force. It's all part and parcel of Romans chapter 13, which is the police officer's chapter and the chapter that deals with human authority and human government. But what we're talking about here is just day-to-day, mundane, routine circumstances that we all find ourselves in. All right? Recompense to no man evil for evil. Don't let them have it. Be kind. Be gracious, be loving. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. A Christian businessman ought never to be accused of being a crook or being a cheat. Wherever the believer finds himself, he will be a witness for the beauty and goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ, or he will bring shame on the name of Christ, depending on the way he responds and the way he behaves. Any questions or comments? All right. Good. That either means you're all completely confused, you've gone to sleep, or I was pretty clear. Or we're guilty. Or you're under conviction. (laughs) You know, there's the other choice. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this evening. God, help us to be men and women that live out our faith day in and day out. Help us to be people that bring glory to the cause of Christ. That when people see us and and hear us and observe the way that we live and the way that we respond to circumstances, that they would see there's something different about us. God, help us. Keep us from being uh, people that would harm your cause. Help us, Father, to always be yielded to the Spirit of God and for under his control. And Lord, we pray that we truly may be bright lights of what the grace of God can do in a life. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I think we are a couple minutes early, but that's okay. You'll beat the water rush.